Okay, how's everybody doing? All right. Is the console getting a little clearer? No. <laughs> it'll clear up. We actually, it'll it'll come to you once we start putting it into use. Okay. Right. <laughs> no. Um, no, that's true. It, it'll start coming to you. You really gotta do it. You know. I mean, we can we can show you and point and say this is how you do it, and you know. This is how you ride a bicycle, but until you get on it and fall off, you're not going to know how to ride it, right? So, you know. Jokes. But uh, <laughs> next week, we start recording. Okay. <laughs> All right. And uh, we're going to go over some session procedures today. Um, we'll have handouts for you available. Oh. Uh, plus some of my own stuff besides that I'd like to convey to you. And... Uh, We'll probably have them available to you on Monday. Okay. Setting up a session. Setting up a session. Here you are. Get out of the workshop. You got your job in the studio. Yeah. Hey, yeah, you didn't know that, did you? Hey. <laughs> and uh, there's some things that uh, you should be aware of. Um, okay, a guy's going to call on the phone. He's going to say, hey, man, uh, you know like to do a session uh you know tell me about it well you need to know how much money he's got no <laughs> i need to know that too um there's a few things you have to ask okay initial conversation one is the type of music okay to give you a ballpark figure here okay um number of instruments if it's rock you can probably figure there's gonna be drums bass um you know, keyboards, electric guitar, probably. All right. And what are they? Um, another thing that's very important, you need to know how many cuts he's going to want to do, how many songs. Okay. Um, and along with that, is it going to be a demo or is it going to be a master? A demo is less critical than a master. It's usually a tape that is just used to show this group's potential. <laughs> In other words, a group may come in and say, look, I want to make a demo. You know, I need a tape to send out to club owners, you know, show them what we're doing. That's the demo. And you don't have to be as critical as a master. And a master is a tape that they are probably going to press. Yeah. Um, the rates per hour are the same. Some studios will charge less. Not many. But uh, the rates per hour are the same. It's just that you spend less time doing it. So they say that way. Um, a master is also usually used to be marketed. Once in a while, you get a guy who wants to come in. He wants to make his own record just for him and his friends. You know, that happens. But more often than not, they're going to come in and they're going to want to market. They're going to want to cut an album, put out several thousand, and then try to market it if possible. So a master is going to be pretty critical. And... Uh, You'll, you'll probably want to spend enough time to get a good cut, and uh, hopefully they got the box. Hey. Um, usually, for a demo, I'd say it should take three to five hours per song, okay? Um, there's, going to be some, there's going to be an hour or two for setup time, get a drum sound. Make sure everything's plugged in. Mic port doesn't work, you gotta change it. Okay. Um, usually a studio will give setup time, either an hour or when the tape starts rolling, whichever comes first. Usually the hour is up first. Uh, okay. And for a master, you're gonna want to spend more time, usually four to seven hours per song. Now, this is gonna vary pretty much because on like an album project, What's going to happen is, what you do is they'll have, okay, we got eight songs. Maybe they got 10, 12 songs, mm -hmm. and they'll pick the best eight. Well, what you usually do is get a good sound on the drums, bass guitar, keyboards, and electric guitar, and you'll do the basic tracks for all the songs, okay? Obviously, that's going to save them time, because then you don't have to reset up, re-get a sound, all that stuff, okay? So it's not going to be quite four to seven hours per song because of that. Okay. Overdubs do take a long time though, so depending upon the complexity of the song, it may take a little longer. 
if it's country western, maybe it won't take as long as maybe um, a lot of the more sophisticated rock and roll synthesizers and tense backup vocals and stuff like that. Okay, and before the client arrives, you can do things like get the drum set ready if they're using your drum set. You can uh, get the headphones ready. You already know how many musicians there's going to be. You can get the board ready, put it in record mode, put your piece of tape down. You're going to want to plan out how many uh, how many tracks you're going to want to use for drums, hopefully, and how many channels you want to use, how many mics you want to use, and whether you'll have to submix the drums or not. You should have that decided before they come in the door. Um, set up the piano mics and FNF. Uh, you also need to ask them uh, if they are going to need any musicians. Lots of times we'll get a call in the studio and the guy will say, well, you know, do you have a drummer that I could have play in my session, session drum? Or maybe a violin player, or maybe backup vocals. Yeah. Those things all need to be arranged beforehand. Clean and demag, tape machine, yep, yep, yep. Set the mics on the stands, that'll save you some time. Uh, oh, if your studio's got a piano, make sure the piano is tuned. Our piano really goes out of tune a lot. It's, some pianos are funky in that way. If they're using, if the group is using your drum set, it would be a good idea to make sure the drums are tuned, okay? You'll learn about that later on, tuning the toms, right? Making sure you, you have a decent drum sound to start out. And put the board in record mode and all that. Now, when the client arrives, you want to make some initial studio contact. Hi, my name's Dave Egan, you know. Uh, what's your name? And usually there'll be one band member or maybe a manager or a producer who you're going to be dealing with. Money-wise, you want to know him right off the bat, find out his name, tell him yours. Find out all the names of the musicians and write them down next to the talkback button on the console. Very important. Call them by their names. Call them by the first name. Tell them your name, okay? It's not, uh, hey, you, turn up your guitar, huh? Hey, you know, you know you're, you're doing a business here, you know, and uh, you, you as an engineer are, are dependent upon their satisfaction. Okay, you need to build up clientele. You need to build up a reputation. So, uh, you have to treat them good. Um, take charge of the setup, okay? When they come in, you should already have pretty much in mind where you want the drums, okay? Do I want them in the booth? Do I want them in the room so I can get a pretty much of a live sound? Um, put the guitar over here. Put his amplifier in the ISO booth. Run his guitar cord out to the main room so he can sit out with everybody else. If there's another guitar player, put him in the other ISO booth. Run his guitar cord out so they're all in the studio, but their amplifiers are shut off. If you don't have an ISO booth, what can we use? Go -bo. Go -bo. Go -bo. Right. Put it against the wall, put a gobo up there, mic it that way. Okay. What will we probably do for the bass guitar? Direct. Direct, direct line it, right. Okay. Um, make them comfortable. Okay, you've got your musician or your headphones there for the musicians. You know, make sure there's plenty of chairs in the studio. Um, Oh, very, very often there's going to be a need to, for a scratch vocal. What's a scratch vocal? One that makes the bass player. Right. Uh, the singer is going to put down a vocal to talk through the song for the musicians, okay, so they don't have to count how many verses go by, and thereby their music will be very mechanical, okay, because they're counting, and they won't be in a groove. You know, they, they rely on the singer to go in between verses and sing. So if, the, if that's the case, what you want to do is keep the scratch vocal mic away from the drums and away from any open mics. Maybe put him in an isolation or gobo him on, okay? Because if he bleeds into the drum mics and he doesn't sing it exactly like he sang it on the scratch, you're going to have a little ghost image in there, okay? Also, a real problem is when... When the guy who's singing is the keyboard player also, in the case of like the grand piano in there, what can we do to the grand piano to isolate it? Power on rhythm. 
cover it with blankets, okay? We'll, we'll lower the lid. Okay, there's a little peg about this long. We can lower the lid down under the peg, slip the stands in there with the mics on, put blankets on. But with a powerful singer, even that is not enough to keep the vocals out of the piano mics. And that is a real task. Sometimes it's unavoidable, okay? But with everything else going on, drums, electric guitars, and lead line itself, Lots of times it's going to be covered up anyway, but sometimes it don't, <laughs> okay? And uh, you just have to be conscious of these things, all right? Um, yeah, drums in the farthest corner. You can put the drums against the wall in the corner, piano, piano lid. Uh, in fact, you, you'll notice that we have the piano situated in such a way that the lid opens towards the wall in the studio. That helps a little bit too. Okay. <clears throat> um, also, I'd like to, myself, I like to record the piano as an overdub rather than on basic tracks. Because rather than squash the lid down with blankets and stuff, I'd rather have the lid open and have the mics away from the strings a little bit to give it a more open sound. Okay. So sometimes I kind of try to talk, hey, you know, oh, I'd sure like to do the piano as an overdub, you know. You, there's a lot of psychology involved with with doing a session. You know, you'll have a drummer come in with his drum kit. Maybe he has this big monster kit, okay? But lots of times, they don't know how to tune the drum set. They're not hep to that, okay? And you as an engineer should be conscious of that. And lots of times, drummers and musicians in general are personalities and they have egos, you know. And uh, uh, maybe he doesn't, you know... He said, you know, can you tune your drums out? He says, no, it's fine. You know, you, you need to, you need to deal with them. What you can do is, uh, you can uh, say, well, you know, uh, I think I'm getting a pretty good sound, but uh, why don't you tell me, you know, why don't you come in here in the control room and I'll go out there and bang on your kit. Okay, so he goes in the control room, you go in the ISO booth, bang on his kit, and you're tweaking it with the key. <laughs> 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 Now, sometimes, sometimes you got to be a little sneaky, but what are you doing? You're trying to get them a good sound. That's what you're trying to do. You're trying to get that drummer a good sound that he doesn't know he can get. Okay, so you're working on their behalf. It's not like you're trying to pull one over on them. It's kind of a white lie type thing. You know, you you want to get a good sound. Okay. So, and and guitar players, boy, they can come in with out of tune guitars. You know, sometimes they can't hear. You know, to tune it, and. Uh, Sometimes they can hear, they can slightly hear the tune, but the bridge is out of tune. So on one chord, it sounds in tune. They go to another chord and it's not in tune. Oh boy. You know, if it's a demo, well, you can try to work on them, but you know, if he doesn't see the light, well then what can you do? You know, um, it's their nickel, <laughs> you know. Um, but an aggressive engineer will try to deal with these and solve them and get a good sound. Anyway, okay. Um, I don't really like to do acoustic guitar or woodwinds or brass on the basic tracks either. Sometimes I do because of feel, okay? Um, lots of times if the band plays live, they'll be used to hearing the brass and all the stuff going on. Then you put them in a sterile environment such as the studio with headphones and it's real quiet. And there's not a smoke-filled room, you know, and they, they don't get into the groove. Okay. Well, sometimes you got to feel that out. Again, it takes like you know a little bit of psychology on your part, and you got to feel them out. And if they're not cutting it, well, maybe you should suggest that. Well, let's get these guys out here and have them play right along. You know. But like I said, I shy away from doing the brass and that acoustic guitar, woodwinds, especially string like violins, and cellos. And stuff. Um, we're talking bleed through real bad. Okay, with the drums coming in the brass mics and everything, it gets crazy. Um, when you do mic, uh, brass and strings in a group, um, it's a good idea a lot of times to group them together, maybe put four seats together and put one or two overhead mics above them. Okay. You'll get a more natural sound that way than if you put them, spread them out in the room and mic them separately and bust into one track. It'll, it'll sound like it was done that way. I mean, the average person would not really hear that, but it would sound unnatural, okay? It would, it'll sound a little more natural if you group them together. 
Um, when it comes to miking, miking instruments, use your ears, okay? Now you're gonna be coming in here. You're gonna be a little nervous about the console. Oh boy, here we go. Okay, put it in record mode, okay. And sub makes the drums, hey, no problem. Hook that mic up here. And you're gonna be kind of clouded by all the technical stuff, okay? Sometimes you're gonna to need to set yourself away and listen, okay? Now you all came here because you like music and you know, you like a good sound, okay? Now, what you have to do is trust yourself, okay? You know what you like. You don't know what you like when you're doing it yourself yet. In other words, you at the board, you haven't gotten a good sound. You haven't gotten a bad sound yet because you haven't done it yet. So you don't have any parameters to deal with yet. But if you if you can just let go a little bit and just use your ear and listen and say, oh, I don't like that kick drum sound, you know? And if you don't, go out and change the mic. Go out and change the position. If it's if it's uh, a squeaky pedal, run to the store and get some oil. Okay. Um, if it's too uh, ringy, put a little more padding in there. Blanket on the bottom with the bottom of a mic stand works real nice. Also, another thing about um, mic and a drum kit, especially the kick drum, is. Um, Lots of live players will often have a front head on their kick drum. Well, you'd kind of like to talk them into taking it off. You know, you, you take them aside and say, well, I can get you a real good sound. If, you know, you'll take that front head off your drum, you know, because a double, two heads on, the, on, a, on a kick drum really is ringy. It's not a nice thud, thud, thud. Okay. It's pretty loose. It doesn't have a good, you know, chest pound. You know what I mean? Um, so, you know, you might want to do that too, okay? I've never really run into a situation where I couldn't do it. One time I had to mic a kick drum from the from the front head next to the beater. And the sound was okay, you know? It wasn't great, but it was workable, you know? Drummer was kind of funky, but okay, we got a good sound and the session was fine. We, the rest of the guys did great, you know? We got a decent drum set. But, you know, you as an engineer are always consciously trying to get a better sound for these guys and for you. Obviously, you want some nice tapes of your own to, uh, you know, have as your uh, resume. Okay. So if you're schlepping around as an engineer with all these sessions, why well, you're not going to have good tapes? So you need to be a little bit aggressive. Um. One another thing about miking. I say use your ear, and I mean that literally. If you go, if you have some time or you're you're in between your sessions here. Go into one of the studios and shut the door if there's something in the control room and have somebody else hit the drum and move your ear up and down right next to it. Okay. We all know what a snare drum sounds like from across the room. Wap, wap, wap. He's hitting it over there. But you're miking it right on it. Okay. And that's a whole different ballgame. Okay. Also, an acoustic guitar. Have somebody play an acoustic guitar and get right up close. Get in front of the sound hole, move up the bridge, go down the body. You'll find that miking the sound hole isn't really isn't really desirable because of the boominess. Well, um, if you have a guitar, I've found that the best place to mic a guitar is right about here or here, kind of facing straight in, and the hole of the guitar is right here. So you're getting a little bit of the hole, and you're getting the strings. Okay, because a lot of the guitar sound comes. From the strings as well it's not just the body same thing with yeah on an acoustic guitar he's not going to probably be playing right up here and as far as strumming nah it really wouldn't be a problem no you do want to be conscious about not getting in his way okay lots lots of times i'll be all over a drum set with microphones and i usually say hey you know tell me if this is going to affect your playing and i'll move the mics or you know, if it looks like he's going to whack the mic and the snare drum with the stick, why well, you, you obviously, you know, move that away a little. Is there another question here? Um, if you move, place the microphone, um, like the top part or the bottom part, wouldn't you pick up too much either bass or, or treble from the strings? Here? Yeah. There'll be a little noticeable difference. If this was up here, you might hear a little bit more of this or a little bit more of this, but I'm, I'm speaking more of, as I'm sitting with an acoustic guitar like this, have the mic about this far away. 
I'm personal comment, editorial comment by Dave Egan. I don't really like a real close up mic acoustic guitar. It sounds real unnatural. It sounds weird. Okay. I like to have it out a little bit, about two, three feet away. Then it sounds more natural. We are used to hearing a guitar not right up against his thing there, but maybe, you know, across the living room or, you know, sitting right next to him. Okay. I like to mic it about two or three feet away, right in front, right, right across here. Okay. That's my personal comment. Please, again, use your ears. In here, in the workshop here, this is a great chance for you guys to experiment. And if it doesn't sound great, find out here. Don't find out when you get your job, okay? You'll be finding out there too. You're constantly learning. I am too. Everybody is. There's no experts in this field, okay? Miking is such a subjective thing, right? Um, but again, you trust your ear. And if it sounds unnatural, or if you say, oh, you know, that's not really appealing, well then, Try something different, okay? Sometimes these guys are going to be watching the clock, you know, checking you out, you know, okay, how about, can we get things rolling here? Well, you know, obviously you're on your toes anyway, but you you have to feel out that situation too. You have to be conscious of the fact that these guys are on a budget, you know, they got their PA to pay off and, you know, they're renting a truck to carry their stuff around in and they got all this other stuff and they're trying to get this little demo together, you know. Sometimes you're not going to be able to do that. But like I said, here at the workshop, it's a great time to do it. Okay. Excellent opportunity. What's the uh, word for close miking? What's the effect when I sing your close? Proximity effect. Okay. Not only with vocals, but again, with acoustic guitar. If you mic the sound hole up close, you're going to get the proximity effect. It's going to be a great boost. Low end. Great boost in low end. Um, close making, close miking a singer will give him more presence and more clarity. Distant miking will make him sound different. You know, one of the best uh, albums for close and distant miking, for for examples on on one album, having different examples of stuff is Pink Floyd, The Wall. They have all different kinds of things going on, and they have. They have voices coming from way out there. And, you know, it's not just because they have the fader down and it's in the background of the music, but he's mic'd far away. And you can tell. I mean, you're not consciously saying, well, he's across the room from the microphone. But your ear psychoacoustically can sense that. Just like you can hear me now with all the reflections in the room, okay? As opposed to me sitting right up in front of you talking to you personally, okay? You can, you can hear that psychoacoustically. You can um different mics have different responses and more important placement da, 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 da. yeah different mics will have different characteristics and as we go through the workshop here you'll uh maybe start to get opinions on different mics okay maybe you'll say oh i don't like that mic on piece of guitar i tried that you know and you'll it's a good idea to uh experiment too maybe if you used a sennheiser on the snare sennheiser 441 and it did great Hey, I got a great mic for my snare now. Well, next time it comes around, put that aside and try a different one. Okay. Also, when you do a vocalist, suppose we got the basic tracks down in the studio here, and uh, it's time to do the lead vocal. Okay. Put up two mics. Okay. And A, B, the faders. Okay. Try one, try the other, try the one, try the other. Usually, it will take about 30 seconds before you decide which one you like, unless they're really close, which is unusual usually you could say nah let's go with this one you know in which case you just pull the other fader down and continue on with the session you don't have to run out there and take the mic cord out and put the microphone away you know you can just set two mics up pull the fader down okay let's roll the tape or maybe you can have the, one of the mic jockeys just pull the stand away so it doesn't intimidate the singer so it doesn't look like you know the president up there with a row of mics let's see now um what are what are the three basic pickup patterns one is omni, omni all the way around right yeah good for in the studio it's probably good for miking several background singers have them stand around the mic give them all headphones and hey they're all being picked up okay 
that is one of the few situations where omnidirectional mics work in the studio. What mic would we rather have in the studio? Cardio. Right. So we can localize sound source. Sometimes in the case of two singers, you can put a bi-directional mic happening like this. Okay. Um, what's hypercardioid or shotgun? What is that? Hypercardioid, supercardioid. Does anybody know? Very directional. Direct huh? Very directional. Very directional microphone. Where is that used mainly? Television. Television. Like the guys who stand on the sidelines and they can hear the huddle. You know, they got that big dish. You know. They can like that. Okay. Basic suggestions for mic placement for drums. For a 16 track recording, we usually don't like to use more than six tracks of drum, averaging four or five. If it's going to be a lot of overdubs, usually four mics for the drums. You'll want a mic, you'll want to have the kick on a separate track. You'll want to have the snare on a separate track. Usually you'll have two rack toms and a floor tom. You'll want to mic them separately. Now you might want to put them only on two tracks, but uh, you can decide that once you know how many overdubs there are. Uh, Hi-hat, well, if I was doing a disco song, I'd probably want to mic the hi-hat or rock and roll too. I'd, I'd probably mic the hi-hat anyway, just in case. But lots of times, you're going to get enough bleed through from the snare mic, from the hi-hat, that you don't need a hi-hat mic. And lots of times, it sounds more natural. That's another thing I don't like close mic, is a hi-hat. Okay? Uh-oh. Editorial comment. Now, this was a personal comment again, okay? Um, in a studio now, I think it sounds kind of funny to close mic a hi-hat. It sounds pretty neat coming through the tom mics and through the overheads because it sounds more natural. Again, you're never listening right up close with that guy going, okay? And it's real harsh, okay? It's not, okay, it's clasp, 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 okay? It's real metallic and it's real mechanical sounding. But I do have tapes where I, you know, mic the hi-hat. So, like I said, anything goes. I might place anything goes. Yeah. There be like a happy medium between the snare and the... You could do that. You could put a happy medium between the snare and the hi-hat with one microphone. Uh, some of you might think, well, why not use a bi-directional mic and have a face down at the snare and up at the hi-hat? It's a great idea, but what do you hear? You'll hear intense hi-hat and not enough snare. The hi-hat is a much more transient instrument than the snare drum is. Okay. The hell is going on? An eight-track recording? How many tracks do we probably want to use? Two. Two, Two tracks. Some engineers will use a stereo setup, which is what we primarily use here because that's awful nice okay so when the toms go around you can hear that um drums left drums right some will want the kick drum separate from the rest of the kit in which you have a kick drum track and a mono drums track okay that's pretty good too especially if you're doing something with a beat like disco where you need to fool around with the kick drum in the final mix okay remember once you submix the drums you can't change it later on okay um sometimes three tracks ray track sometimes kick snare and then toms mono toms okay in a four track setup some of you i know have four tracks at home what do you usually use how many tracks one one track for drums lots of times you want to put the bass guitar along with the drums okay so you have a rhythm track Okay, so you can use the other things for guitars and vocals. Okay, a piano. You can suspend one mic above the strings, or we can suspend two mics above the strings and have a stereo piano. Okay, what 
Okay. The piano is a is a real funky instrument to mic and stereo because it's easy to get face cancellation. What two things can I remember when I mic piano to minimize face cancellation? What's one of them? Three to one rule. Three to one rule. What does that mean? That's right. That's right. The mics should be three times the distance from each other than from the sound source. In other words, one foot from the piano each, three feet from each other. Okay. What's another one? XY. XY, 90 degree miking. Okay. That's another. Okay. Okay. And again, with the piano, you might want to experiment a little bit. Okay. Um, they also have pickups now. Crown makes them. PCMs, they call them. Yeah. Where there's just a metal plate that you set on the piano and picks up the vibrations from the piano. Bass guitar, we usually direct line it, right? I will most always direct line it unless the guy brings in a neat bass amp and for some reason it sounds great. Hey, well, then let's mic it, okay? Most of the time, a direct line will give a nice, clean, clear sound, okay? Um, in an 8-track situation, what uh, what should we know about the bass guitar when recording on 8-tracks? Put it on the outside track. Why? Right, and what's that called? Huh? The fringing effect. That's what it's called. The fringing effect is on the outside edges of the tape, that's the area that is probably going to get the most physical abuse, especially when the flange of the reel is a little wobbling here at tick, 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 okay? It's kind of rubbing the outside. Well, what's happening is the outside tracks are being slightly affected by physical abuse, okay? Um, what's the first thing that goes? The high end, the treble region goes, first thing. So in that type of situation, we're going to want to put only low frequency instruments on the outside tracks. One of them is a bass guitar. What could another one be? Kick drum. Kick drum. Excellent. Yeah. That's right. Um, however, in the case of the MCI on two inch tape, that is not really the case. It, it's okay, even, even if you don't do it in the eight tracks, but I think it's still a good rule to follow on eight track recording. But on the two inch tape, nah, you really don't have to worry about it that much anymore because they make the machine so precise that uh, it handles the tape very nicely, especially the MCI. You can tell some of you have operated already that, you know, it's a very smooth operating machine. In which case, what we'll probably do is put the kick drum on one in Studio C, snare on two, maybe hi hat in three. And then four and five we'll use for our tom submix. And then six will be the bass guitar. So when you go in there to mix down a couple of days later, no matter what group it is, no matter what uh, multi-track tape it is, you know where the drums and bass are going to be. You can slap it on. You know where your rhythm tracks are already. You can immediately pan four and five out. Okay. It just helps you out a little bit, a little quicker. Ah. Strings, cello, violin, viola. Unless you're really doing a, a rock and roll violin solo, um, it's kind of nice to have the mics a little far away for the same reason. It's more natural to our ears. But just because I'm saying this doesn't mean that I don't want you to try. I mean, I want you to find out for yourself, okay? Um, the sound is coming from the strings. It's coming from the body. Same thing with brass, um, especially the saxophone, actually. Uh, sound from a saxophone, most of the sound is not coming from the hole there, okay? It's coming from the whole instrument. It's coming from the reed up here, the holes along the way, and the hole as well, okay? It's coming from the whole instrument. You can stereo mic a sax by doing a 90-degree routine like this, one facing up here and one facing down there. Now, it's cool if you're into it, but hey, I mean, you know whatever. Um, 
I kind of like to just have the sax player stand and have a mic about this far away, right about there. It just sounds a little more natural. Um, sometimes on a saxophone or a clarinet, the clicking of the valves is going to be a problem. You'll hear that as he fingers the saxophone, you'll hear him clicking in the valves. Well, what can we do for that? We could pull the mic away a little farther away, maybe. If, if you hear the clicking of the valves, you're probably close micing the sax. Okay. That's probably what's happening. Sticky keys. Sticky keys, yeah. Huh? Any questions? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sure. Did, did you hear that over here? Yeah. Okay, lots of times. Use alcohol. Or rolling Or rolling paints. We all have those. None of that happens in the studio now. Come on. Um, yeah, use alcohol to clean the valves. Okay. Or have the musician clean the valves with his valve cleaner or whatever. He should have some. I mean, after all, he's coming into the studio, he ought to be taking care of his instrument. Okay. Also, also, when you are done, zero the board. What does that mean? That means pull all the faders down, turn all your monitor knobs down, all the reverb is down. Pan knobs are straight up. Take all the bus signs out. Take any pads out that you might have in. Pull out the mic cables. Put the mics away. Leave the studio in the condition that you would like it to be in when you get there yourself. It's only respect for the next guy. Okay. Put the soda cans in the garbage and maybe get the beer bottles under the piano. And, <laughs> you know. But boy, is that a nice thing to come into a clean studio. You don't want to come into a studio where there's pop cans on the console and there's cigarettes with ashes, you know, mm -hmm. hanging off and the faders are all up and the monitors are, you know, all turned which way. Okay. Leave it in a situation that you'd like to see it in yourself. Okay. How about the situation when, uh, say, you didn't quite get to the group, the musician would say, you've got everything set and you want to get back. I'm having this set up. Yeah, right. Right. And I'm Good point. Um, if you are finishing at night, you're halfway done with the group, you're coming in the next day, you know that you are going to be the first one in the studio the next day, while you can leave the board set, okay? Just leave everything the way it was, okay? Then that's okay, if you know you are going to be the first one in there. Yeah? When you find something like a, um, sex phone or even like a guitar, maybe across the room for like the moment or something? You bet. Uh, one, yeah, let me embellish on that. What we can also do, another little thing on miking is, it's usually done a lot with a guitar amp or a saxophone too. You can put the guitar amp on the side of the room, close mic it, and then put another mic on the other side of the room, and then turn up the close mic in the fader, and then with the distant mic, ride the fader up until you hear it come in, and then set it where you like it. Put it a little too much, and then back it off, and then come up and experiment with it like that. Okay. You know what they did for... Uh, for, for Super Tramp's album, Breakfast in America, the logical song, they recorded this saxophone in the men's bathroom the studio. Why do you suppose? The tile wall is so bright, okay? Did you ever notice that you sound, your voice sounds real good in the bathroom when you sing? Oh, okay? That's because there's so much reflected sound that if there's any fluctuations in your voice, the reflected sound will, will cover it up. And you'll always sound better in the bathroom. Okay. Yeah, I tell you, I'm dying to get something really tiley in here, you know, really bright sounding in this in this studio here. I've tried I've tried putting a guitar amp out in the skylight room, you know, and miking it halfway across the room and yeah, it sounds like the skylight room, you know. But uh, you know, experiment like that, it's great, you know, if you have the time, if you can afford the time, you know. Sometimes I'll in between workshops, I'll use, if I'm doing a session in C, I'll use Studio D as my drum booth, and I'll run cables into Studio D because it's the tile floor. Sounds great for the toms, especially for the floor tom. 
because he goes bubba da boom and it really reflects off the floor and comes in the other mics. <laughs> Did mic floor tom tom can be learned? Hmm? Did a mic floor tom tom be learned? Yes, I have done that before. Lots of times, uh, miking a floor tom from the top will sound kind of wimpy, okay? In which case, you will mic it from underneath, okay? Likewise with the with the rack toms as well, okay? Try them on top, okay? It, it's nice because of the cymbals bleed through and it's a real natural sound with the cymbals. Sometimes though, you want to try miking from underneath. Put them in, put them in about halfway and lots of times I find myself facing them towards the corner of the drum rather than towards the middle of the drum where the, where the stick is gonna be striking, okay? Maybe towards the sides a little bit, but about halfway in. In a situation like that, you might need some overhead mics, okay? Because you'll lose a little symbols, okay? Incidentally, I mean, some of you have had a little experience before. Anything you can, you know, bring to the front, why please? And then we're all here to learn as well. Um, but basically, when it comes to miking, there's no right and there's no wrong, okay? I mean, whatever it takes to get that sound is where it's at. All right, getting a little more specific on laying tracks. Basic tracks. Hey, what are the three modes of recording? One is the first one, basic tracks. Okay, second, overdubs or sweetening. And the last, remix, mix down. Okay, basic tracks. When I set up those drums, boy, oh boy, I can bet that those drums will probably overdrive the mic preamp, in which case I can have the drums, drum channels right away. Most of the time, they're gonna overdrive. Maybe it doesn't need it at all, maybe it needs it more padding, okay? But when I, when, even before I pull that fader up, it's on the, in Studio C, it's 15 dB, every track for the drums. Um, Check, listen for hums from the guitar amps, you know, buzzes and 60 cycle hum. Um, usually the amplifier will have a ground switch that you can flip back and forth to see which way hums the least. <laughs> see some pretty funky guitar amps come in the studio, you know, they bring it in a bag and assemble it right there. <laughs> and uh, I used to have a pretty funky one myself. I had an old Sears silver tone. It was about this big. Oh, it was a beast. But I turned it all the way up and the distortion was great. And uh, I used to plug it right into my Fender amp. So I'd use the this cheap little Sears to get my sound and then I'd amplify it with the Fender. And it was falling apart. I mean, I'd carry it and the transformer would hang off in the wires and go wah, wah, wah. Until one day it shorted out and caught on fire. Hey, there went my guitar sound. Um, so check for hum and listen for rattles and buzzes on the drum kit. Okay, maybe he hits a tom tom once in a while and, and a little screw goes. Just that, okay. Watch out for that. You can take masking tape and put it over things like that. Okay, or else get a screwdriver and tighten up all the screws. That's something that really gets by. You know, you're concentrating on getting all the levels up, getting a headphone mix, a mix down time. Every time he hits that tom, you hear a little yeah. You know, a little rattle on a screw, you know, oh boy. Okay, now, when you're getting a sound for the basic tracks, let me see, I got a good thing here. I am real organized. When you, uh, when you're getting a sound, it's a three-step thing. You're gonna wanna pad things. First thing you do, pull up the fader, Get a level on your meters for tape. Second step, turn up the monitor. Okay, I'll, I'll go through them real quick and then I'll go back and embellish on. <clears throat> pull, up the, pull up the fader, get a level on tape. Turn up the monitor so you can hear it. And then go for the headphone knob and put it in their headphones. Do that for each channel. Move to the next one. One, two, three. Move to the next one. Level on. Bass player's playing. And you don't have, he doesn't hear himself in his headphones, you know, and he's just playing and, you know, you're looking around and stuff, you know, and it's a good idea to, to make them feel like they're included too. Oh boy, is it a, 
the glass in between the control room and the studio is like a, you know, you know, you're you're distant from the musicians. And what you want to be is you want to be really in touch with the musicians and you want to be close. Okay. You want to be almost as if you're a band member yourself. And you are as an engineer. You are. You're responsible for their sound. So you want to be constantly asking them, is your headphones all right? Can you hear yourself all right? Lots of times they're not going to tell you. They're going to say, yeah, it's fine. You know, when they don't realize that it could be better. <laughs> they don't realize it. All you have to do is just turn the headphones up a little bit more and they'll be a little happier. They might play a little better. Okay. Constantly bedroom about the headphones. Okay. So those three things, turn up the level for tape, put it in the monitor so you can hear it, and then turn up the headphones for the musicians. Do that for every channel and you can cook right along. You're going to want to uh, bus assign channels to tracks. Okay, make sure you do that. You're not gonna get a good, you're not gonna get a sound at all in the console unless you just add. Um, sub mix if you have to. Um, now, when you're getting a level for tape, funny thing happens. Okay, you say, you say the drum. Okay, hit your kick drum. Boom, 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 boom. Get your level real fine. Snare. Boom, 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 boom. Okay, real fine. Toms. Boom, boom. Get all the drums. In. Okay, bass guitar. Dun, 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 dun. Okay, fine. Guitar. Okay. Dun, dun. All right, would you guys run the song down for me? Dun, 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 you know? <laughs> Almost every time you can figure that they're going to play louder together than they are when you're having them get a sound check. Okay. You can figure that for most of the time. Okay. So when you're getting your initial level, be a little bit conservative with the levels, especially on the kick and snare and bass drum. Okay. Because he'll start yapping that snare once everybody starts playing. So be a little conservative and always have them run down the song before they go to tape, obviously. So you can get a final level check. You can get a final level check for the tape get a final level check for their headphones. Okay. Because once they start crashing on the drums, bass player might not hear his bass loud enough. Okay. So you got to be conscious of that. Um, solo things out while they're running down the song. Solo things out. Make sure you don't hear any rattles or buzzes on the drums, okay, while he's playing along. Make sure that kick pedal isn't squeaky. Um, check for phase cancellation. How do we do that? Listen in mono. Okay. Equalization. Aha. Quite the debatable issue. Do I EQ going on to the multi track? Do I wait for mix down to EQ? Do I do both? Do I do it not at all? Well, that is something that engineers can argue back and forth about forever. And it's all in the mags, modern recording, DB, you know, pro con, pro con, you know. Anymore. <laughs> I think the consensus of most engineers is that you should get it to sound good on the multi-track playback, whether that means EQing or not. Okay. When it comes to getting a sound, period, I would rather change the mic, change the mic placement, or pad the drum a little more, retune it, or change the positioning of the mic, rather than try to get my sound with EQ. EQ is icing on the cake. Okay. What I'll do is I'll turn up the fader, turn up the monitors, turn it up in their headphones, and I'll listen. Uh, that's not quite right. I'll play with the EQ no more than about 30 seconds. Okay. Now, you guys are starting out. You'll want to play with a little more so you can get the feel for what EQ does. But if it, if it takes you more than a minute or two and you still haven't gotten that sound with the equalizer, you better be heading out to the studio and changing the mic or changing the mic place. Okay. Because that's really where your sound is going to be determined from. Okay. Um, like I said, any more, I think engineers will agree that uh, you should make it sound good on the multi-track playback. Because if you have a lousy sounding multi-track, you can bet your cookies that that mix down tape isn't going to be much better. Okay. There's, this, there's a, an expression that engineers use uh, in a funny way, and that's called, ah, oh, we'll fix it in the mix. You know, and that's uh, that's something you want to say is a joke, not seriously. Okay, gang. Okay. Okay. Try not to over EQ going on tape. Okay. 
If you put it plus six at 6,000 hertz, why and mix down, you can put it minus six at 6,000 hertz to even it out. But lots of times that doesn't quite work out and you don't really want to over EQ. Okay. But do experiment here at the workshop. Do experiment. Elimination of lower frequencies is be better than adding too much upper frequencies. That's also another little common thing for a little handy dandy guy in engineering. Elimination of lower frequencies is better than adding too much of higher frequencies. That's because the meters that most consoles have are average reading meters. And if you crank the high end, chances are you'll probably be saturating the tape, but your meters will not be showing you a hot level. Okay? That can happen often. That's happening. <laughs> Try for a sound that is easily workable in the mix down mode. Once you decide that you've got pretty much what you want, you got everything where you want to go, um, start writing things down in the track sheet. Okay. The end of the session is not the time to do it. You go, well, oh, where's that guitar go? It's on seven or eight. You know, oh well, you know, I'll get it tomorrow. You know, write things down, keep track. The track sheet is really important, especially you're going to forget when it comes time down to mix down, you're going to forget what, what you did. OK, and it's always good to have that track sheet there. Um, once you're about ready to go, the musician, you've got good levels on on your board, looking pretty good. Got a pretty neat monitor mix. I had a little reverb to the vocals and make it sound real nice. Make sure the musicians are happy. It's time to roll the tape. Press the permanent tracks into ready record. Okay. Stand by. Get on the talkback. Stand by. Play and record. And look at that red record button. Make sure it's lit up. And then press talkback tape the roller. Hey, we're recording. Okay. Watch the meters. Watch the musicians. Listen for distortion. Oh boy, is that a biggie. Listen for distortion. Listen for rattles. Be aware, okay? Like I say, watch that record button. Don't press play and record and then go to the talk back. Because maybe you press record first and then play, and the tape is just passing by and not recording, okay? That's a pretty embarrassing situation. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Also, during this whole process, if there's a if there's a producer involved, make sure he's happy. Okay. He's the guy that's flipping the bill, okay? And if he says, nah, I don't like that snare sound, and you think, oh boy, that's one of my best snare sounds. <laughs> he's the one that matters, not you. Okay. You will change the snare sound for him. It's his nickel. Okay. Make sure whoever is flipping the box is happy. Okay, once you get the basic tracks down, one thing you really want to do is once, okay, you got your basic tracks down. They think they got a take. Okay, say so you get on the horn and you say, hey, you know, how did you feel about that? What you want to do is you want to feel the musicians out. If, uh, if, if you thought it sounded lousy and they thought it was pretty good, well, then you can probably figure that they're not going to do much better than that. Okay. Again, here we go. You gotta, you know, feel them out a little bit. Okay. So, you say maybe okay. Well, let's try it again. If things are going down and down and down, you better put a cut on that and keep that first take. Okay. Once in a while, we can do a second take. We don't like to do that a lot because boy, does that eat up the tape in here for the workshop. But if it's a pretty hot group, we'll usually say okay. We'll, we'll try that. Um, but be aware of that, okay? If they, if, if, you know, if it was kind of shaking, they said, hey, man, that was great, you know, you could figure, okay, let's go to overdubs, you know, or maybe have them try it one more time. And if they don't do it better, or if they do do it better, keep that one, okay? But if they don't, well, time to move on to overdubs. Don't harp on it, okay? Don't try to get something out of them that they can't give you, okay? Again, you have to be conscious of that. Overdubs. As soon as uh, they're happy with the tracks, what you want to do is invite them into the control room. 
um, roll the multi-track tape, be sure that everybody's happy with the basic tracks. Okay, maybe the bass player went to the bathroom and he comes back and he said, nah, okay, and you've already pulled all your faders down for the drum levels and you're getting ready for overdubs. Be sure everybody's happy. When it is time for overdubs, take out, ready record on all the basic tracks. Oh boy, if you forget to do that, what'll happen? Erase. erase. You'll erase the basic tracks as you're going to do the overdubs. You repeat that. Then. Embarrassing situation number two. <laughs> <laughs> Repeat that again. Take, okay, time for overdubs. Everybody's happy with the tape. Take the basic track tracks out of ready record. Belly, belly important. Good. Overdubs, we are going to monitor off the record head. If we monitor off the playback head, what happens? Be out of sync. We'll be out of sync. Okay. Overdubs, a word that is commonly used is cell sync process or dubbing or whatever. We all know what they are. Overdubs. Um, set the levels just like you did in basic tracks. Okay. Fader, monitor, headphones. Okay. Same ball game. You want to be sure to give them a good headphone mix of the basic tracks. And... You can let them roll through it once or twice so they can practice their part, okay? Now, we'll be monitoring off the record head on all the basic tracks, except for their track where we'll be in source, okay? Now, the guy might say, listen, can I uh, run through it once or twice? I said, sure. Okay, let's roll the tape. You know what you do? Record them anyway. You know why? Because he'll be loose. He won't be tensed up, you know, and... He may do it great. And the next 10 times he does it, he did, he, he'll never do it like the first time. That has happened more than once to me, and I could kick myself for not recording that first one. Because he's free, he doesn't think he's being recorded, so he'll be a little looser. He'll put some good licks in there, okay? If you don't, you'll say, okay, here we go. Tape's rolling, all of a sudden. It's like a tuned door. When you say tape's rolling in the headphones, it's like, shoop, you know? Everything's real quiet. And, he hears it in his headphones and starts to come in, and he'll be real reserved. Okay. There's, there's little studio gremlins that you can't see in the studio, and they get inside the heads of the musicians, and they screw them up, you know? I mean, dozens of times I've gotten to see bands live, man, and they, you know, out there on stage, they come into the studio and they're all like, well, okay, here we go. <laughs> and they're really reserved and really cautious, you know? Because it's such a sterile environment, and you want to do your best to relieve that. Okay. One thing you can do is have him have him run run it by, but record it anyway. Okay. He might just do it like he's never done it before. Okay. And you can always erase over it if it's no good, right? Okay. Okay. Sometimes the guitar player doing his lead will do fine, and he'll cook right along until he gets to the end where he makes a mistake. Well, you, feeling him out like you've been doing the whole session, you can probably figure that he can't do that middle part again. That was great, but he screwed it up in the end. Okay, what can we do? Punch, punch, in. punch in. Okay, here's the scoop. Punch in. Obviously, we're listening to basic tracks off the record head, okay? We'll also want to do that with the track in question, okay? We'll want to monitor off the record head for that track, but we'll also want to be in ready record as well, okay? So we'll be in ready record and monitoring off the record head so that when, when the instant comes that you want to press that record button, it'll flip over to source and you'll be recording, okay? Now, so you rewind the tape, and what you want to do is tell, tell the guitar player, play right along, just like what you were doing, okay? Don't let him sit there and then just come in on that note because it'll sound like he's coming in on that note. You want it to be a smooth flow, okay? You want to keep the feel smooth. So what you want to do is you want to have him play right along, just like how he was playing. And what you tell him is, what you tell him is this. Say, you know, you just play right along and uh, go from the start of your lead all the way to the end and I'll punch you in and hopefully you won't even hear it at all, okay? And he probably won't hear it at all, okay? Yeah. Sometimes you want to put um, 
fifty tires is good enough. Like maybe you'll leave in two tracks. Could you do that? Um, let's say you know, like maybe we had just been playing it in one. Then you get a punch and he plays it over. Could you maybe just kind of, you know, like in case he does do it good, at the same time again put it on that separate track and save it and then just throw it away if you don't want it. Yeah, we can do that. Sure. Mm -hmm. You can do that as well. Um, the important thing to remember though on a punching is you need to have yourself a little gap of time there where he's not playing. You want to punch in, in between those. Most of the time, It'll be noticeable if you punch in on a note that's sustaining. I've done that sometimes and you can't tell. Sometimes I can tell, but you can get away with it. Okay, that there's other stuff going on and you can't really hear it. Most of the time you can hear it, <laughs> okay? So what you wanna do is find a spot before the mistake where there's, oh, maybe a half a second, maybe a quarter of a second at the least, okay? And that's where you want to punch in. Lots of times you're going to want to anticipate it a little bit. Okay. It's funny, the machinery, as, as you get better and better at engineering, you're going to start to get a feel for the machinery. And I know with the MCI, I want to punch in just a split second before. And I mean a split second. Okay. You want to anticipate that breaking coming up and you want to cut that right before it. Okay. Give the machine time to punch in too. And it's it's only it's only uh, maybe a quarter of a second. I mean, if the guy da na 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 da na na na, that gap right there is more than enough time to punch in. Okay, I'm talking about splitting hairs. Okay, you can do it, but it does take experience. And boy, the first couple of punch ins you do, you know, it's really shaky. It was for me, you know, and it's it's a it's a hard thing, and you really have to concentrate. You have to be inside that guitar you know you have to be the guitar itself almost and you have to be able to punch in right on it all it takes is experience man you guys get it you know and uh it just takes experience hopefully hopefully the bands that we have come in will make mistakes like that to give you the opportunity to do punches okay okay another thing that happens either during overdubs or after overdubs and mixed down is transferring tracks. Okay. Sometimes, here's a good example. Hand claps. They want to do hand claps. Thank you, thank you. Okay. Send the whole band out there. They're all clapping for them, right? Four hand claps are wimpy, right? Nah. Well, what you want to do probably is do several tracks, hand claps. But you don't want several tracks of hand claps for the mix down. That's senseless, okay? You'll want to transfer several tracks to one track, possibly. Okay, you'll have a track of hand claps, okay? So maybe do them se several times so it sounds like a fair amount of people out there doing hand claps. Well, one thing you need to know um, about transferring tracks is that you cannot transfer to an adjacent track. Okay. Okay. Eight track. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay. You've got hand hand claps here, here, and here. Okay. You cannot record these hand claps. You cannot bounce them to an adjacent track on either side. What you'll get is a feedback loop, and the machine will squeal at you. Okay. You cannot record here. You cannot record on this track. You have to go over here or you have to go over here. Okay. Simple rule. You just can't uh, <clears throat> record on adjacent tracks that you're recording from. Okay. And that holds true with just about every machine. Yeah. Uh, crosstalk is merely when you're, when you're hearing the adjacent track. It doesn't necessarily mean it's the same exact thing. What's happening here is you're trying to get a record level on an adjacent track, which is the exact same thing as the track right next to it. And what happens is you're sending it over here. Well, the record head, those tracks are so close together, this track will sense it and pick it up. It'll amplify it, send it back over. It'll even get louder, send it back over, over and over and over and over before you know it. Okay, you got the meters going boing. Okay, and bad news. 
Okay. Then it's time for mix down. Lots of times you want to maybe wait a couple of days before you do the mix down so you can free yourself of uh, being on top of lots of times you need to step away, okay, from the situation and come to it fresh again. Lots of times you'll not have that you'll not have that possibility because they need the tape right away, but you know, it's nice if you can. Set the mic line switch to line position. Zero the board, set EQ to flat, all faders down, pan straight up, and um, set the master fader at zero, start at that position, watch your stereo left and right meters as if they were your rear view mirror of your car, okay, just glance at it once in a while, um, <clears throat> set the tape recorder I have here, set the tape recorder to playback head, okay, that is very, very true in the case of the 8-tracks, or in this 8-track, you can't monitor the playback head on the TA. Um, the playback head on the, on the Atari sounds much better than the record head. The record head is a little noisy. In the case of the MCI, well, the record back and playback head are very similar, very similar. It's really hard to tell. You can mix down up the record head in the bigger. What the Atari does make a big difference. You must record it, or you must mix down a playback head. Um, ah, yes. Be certain no channels are left in record mode. Okay. It's also a good idea to clean the heads of the tape machine again. Probably not have to demag, especially in the case of the MCI. You don't have to demag that machine lots of times. They make that head stack out of metal that's inhibits magnetism. Yeah. Excuse me? Oh, be certain uh, you do not leave any tracks in record mode. Okay. Um, as a general rule, most engineers will probably start with the basic tracks. They'll start with the drums. They'll start with the kick. Listen to it a little bit, EQ a little bit. Bring up the snare. Bring up the other drums, okay? Lots of times, I'll listen to it only shortly, alone, okay? Because you can start spacing out on the kick drum, and then you think you'd make it sound good, and as soon as you bring everything else in, it sounds weird, okay? I would rather judge the sound of each instrument in context against everything else that's happened, okay? That should be your final judgment. But start with the drums, bring up the bass guitar, maybe the piano, rhythm instruments, and then bring in the lead vocal. Some engineers would rather start with the lead vocal and then bring the backup band behind it. Okay, that's another approach. Probably the, the uh, rhythm tracks is a little more common. And uh, bring in any peripheral equipment, digital delay, flanger, harmonizer, all the toys, put them in, experiment with it. Um, send out for coffee and sandwiches. <laughs> Yeah. From here, it's actually mainly experimental, okay? Um, also, during mix down, what you hear is what you get. That's a true statement when mixing down on these boards, okay? If you hear too much reverb, it's going to know what it's going to be. You hear distortion, you'll hear untaste, okay? So if you hear something funky, well, then you better check out what's going wrong, okay? Because you can probably figure it's going to be going on tape. Um, I really will not get into too much more detail on mix down because there's going to be a whole separate mix down lecture. But very basically, we've just gone through basic tracks, overdubs, mix down, and how to set up a recording session. Is there any questions? Yes. How much you mic uh, the rotor times? From above. From above, probably, yeah. Anything else? See you in the studios. Thank you.